Well, hello everyone. My name is Teresa Longo. I'm the Dean for Interdisciplinary Studies in Arts and Sciences. And I, I direct the Charles Center. I'm involved with the Global Film Festival. And that's, that's why we're here today. I'm with Beth Comstock, who has graciously agreed to have a conversation with me that will be included in William & Mary's 2021 Global Film Festival. Let me start first with a, a brief introduction. Until December 2017, Beth spent nearly three decades at GE as Chief Marketing Officer and then Vice Chair of Innovation. She led efforts to accelerate new growth, develop digital and clean energy futures, seed new businesses, and enhance brand value. As President of Integrated Media, at NBC Universal, Beth oversaw TV ad revenue and digital media efforts, including the early development of Hulu.com. Prior to this, she held a succession of roles at NBC, CBS, and CNN Turner Broadcasting. Beth is director at Nike, trustee of the National Geographic Society, and former board president of the Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian National Design Museum. Beth's first book, Imagine It Forward was published in September 2018. Beth, I'm excited to talk to you today about your experiences, your book, Imagine It Forward, and why the ideas in Imagine It Forward are so important right now. Great, thanks, oh. Teresa. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Thanks for having me. I love the I love the William I love that William Mary is part of a film festival. I I'm a big fan of storytelling. Yeah, I do too. This this should be really really fun. So in your book, um, there's a part uh, where you talk about, you know, life at work, and you mention uh, icebreaker and crediting a friend for it, where you're supposed to um, ask people you're talking to, well, what, what can you tell us about yourself that's not on Google? Do you remember that part of the book? Absolutely. Yeah, all right. So I'm breaking the ice. <laughs> Can you tell us something about you that is not on Google? Yes, I'm an aspiring poet. Cool. That would only be a recent addition. I uh, definitely couldn't have uh, answered that uh, even uh, three years ago. But yes, that's something I've uh, been working at in the past few years is trying to, trying to get, put my hand at, at poetry. Wow, so I teach poetry, so I'm super- Oh no, I, I should have known that. I, uh, yeah, well, I'm, I'm aspiring, heavy well, on the aspiration. Oh, so there's a difference between teaching poetry and being a poet. I'm not a poet. So, you know, we're, we're, it's, a good, it's a good mix here. Yeah. That's, that's, really, that's really exciting. It'll be, it'll be good to read your poetry. Yes, um, well, it'll be, you'll be waiting a long time. <laughs> It takes a long time to write something that's short. It sure does. I, I think that's one of the things I like about poetry is the concision of it. I mean, the art of it, of course, mm -hmm. but the fact that it is so concise. And I, I love that. Uh, I love that about it. I, I, I was late to, very late to poetry. I Obviously, I graduated William Mary with a degree in biology. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, I, 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 I only recently found that I'm in love with poetry. Um, so uh, I, it, it's all those things have, it's, it's like a new friend to me. That's great. There are a lot of, you know, quite a few alums who are poets. Well, so that's good to know. That will be, that will be nice to explore those connections at some point. I, I'm going to, well. I've got homework to do. you got homework to do. <laughs> so, um, all right. So now that the ice is broken, let me, um, I'd, I'd really like to start talking about your book. I, I think it's, it was a pleasure to read. And I think that we, you know, could spend a lot of our time today, maybe talking mainly about the book and, and also the experiences that brought you to that book. One thing that strikes me right from the beginning has to do with the combination of two concepts, creativity um, and courage, those aren't always put together, I don't think. So I just would like, that's in your title or in the subtitle, right? Yeah. I'd like to hear you talk about what those two ideas have in common and why they need each other. 
Well, I, I undertook to write a book uh, for a couple of reasons, but one of them was I knew I was coming to the end of my big company career. I mean, I'd been in the job mm -hmm. a long time. I knew there was a forthcoming leadership change. I didn't expect it to happen quite as disruptively as it did. Um, but one of the things I experienced having this sort of strange career, um, certainly at, 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 in, in a GE context, even at NBC, um, the sense that people were often afraid in established organizations to take risks on new ideas. Um, and actually ideas were often not the problem. It was the risk taking, the courage. Um, and so I just saw it time and again. And I, I remembered back in myself of those times, I still have those moments where I'm afraid to try something or uh, I talk myself out of it. And so that became sort of the, the genesis of why I felt I had to write this book, to share my experiences, to share, especially with people who are starting their career or mid-career and just to say this is what I learned or this is where I failed and wish I had done it differently but this idea um, I almost called it uh, permission granted um, because the notion that um, often what I found was people would come in and they'd sit, they'd like pitch an idea and they might get told no and I saw this a lot and you'd never hear from them again and you're like, well, wait a minute. I thought you liked that idea. I thought you wanted to start that new business, pitch that I, uh, that new way of deal, doing something, it, no matter what the idea, but they were told no and you never heard from them. And what I came to realize is that people didn't quite, they, they thought no was no. And really what I so, soon learned by, by being told no many times was oftentimes it's a test of your courage, of your conviction, um, certainly we're here in the context of a film festival. I mean, I think you'd ask any director or producer or actor in a film context, uh, rarely does they, you know, their first pitch or their first mm -hmm. casting or whatever, are they given the keys to, to what they want to do? And often it's a test. So for me, creativity and courage, it's about the, the kind of courage to keep going. Um, for me, I, I had this little mantra I had to come up with for myself, um, which was no is not yet. So I had a couple of experiences, one where I was told no on a big idea I wanted to pitch when I was at, M I pitched at NBC and the team and I came back and by the third time, our boss said yes. And he looked at me and he said, you know, I tried so hard to say no to you, but you made it so darn hard. And I believe you're going to make this work. And I realized he was testing me. So, mm -hmm. so a long-winded way of saying uh, to me, uh, one doesn't happen without the other. And we're talking about kind of you know everyday courage. It's not. It, it's just the the courage of your conviction. Do you remember what that big idea was? Yes, it was pitching at the time. It was the NBC store, which was uh, NBC had just launched, had recently launched its window on the world studio, which, you know, is, is somewhat old, old and been there for a while. And we wanted to create an, what we called the NBC experience. We wanted people at the time I was, I oversaw like the behind the scenes tour guides and the NBC pages. And we said, we can create a better experience where people, we can take people behind the scenes of NBC, which we were doing a little bit, but let's soup it up. And then we'll end in this sort of razzle dazzle experience. And people will be walking around New York City with little bags that say NBC experience. And, um, and it took us a lot of work and it would have been so easy on that first no to go, oh, I guess he's never gonna, I guess he's not gonna go for it. it. And I can't tell you how many times I've seen that where people walk in to pitch an idea, they're told no and they just, they disappear. Um, okay with you if I quote an occasional thing from your book and ask Absolutely. you to explain it? Works. Okay, that's fine, thanks. Great, so on the, on the idea of the imagination, I really like this sentence and I would like you to explain it. You have to respect the data, but love imagination more. What's that about? Well, I believe that very profoundly. Um, I, I worked in a largely, certainly at GE, largely technology and engineering company. Um, we, you know, a company known for Six Sigma and all about de eradicating defects out of processes, which for the most part you want but it's not all just about the data. Everybody wanted a data to prove an idea. Um, and I 
I came to realize the imagination was equally as important. And, and so I became a bit of the, uh, the one who fought for the, uh, the imagination in our organization. And I, I, I use that quote because I'm, I'm actually quite worried in the world today that, that we've, you know, we're, we're sort of in love with the algorithm. It's all about the data, the data science, and we need that for the technological advancements of our society. But I worry that we expect, and, and I, I've heard from many teachers uh, over, since I put my book out that they're frustrated by this, that often their students, uh, more high school students I hear this about, their students are encouraged more toward the data and less toward the creative problem solving. And, and I look at the time we're in right now, you and I are talking via Zoom because there's a pandemic. My guess is every day you're talking to students and, and other colleagues who, who are in, in your position at William & Mary and you're, we haven't been in this before. So you can't pull up some algorithm or some process sheet that says, how did we deal with this pandemic? Uh, no one, many, many of us weren't around in 1921 when the last pandemic happened. So how are you gonna do it? You have to figure it out. So that's, I think the real challenge for all of us going forward is more of a figure it out, imaginative mindset. And yeah, the data will follow, the data helps validate it, but don't lead with the data. Yeah. Um, How do you see that? I mean, I'm, I well, mean, you're I, in interdisciplinary studies. You, you, that would, I would imagine that's oh, yeah. I mean, action for everybody who's in, who, who's on that path at William & Mary. I think our students are very attracted to imaginative work, actually, and they're really good at it. I sometimes wonder if the thinking around I must go to data first has to do with the fear about getting a job. Yeah. That what employers are looking for is very specific and um, it has to do with being able to, to handle data. So, you know, in the interdisciplinary world, what we want to have happen is, the, is both. I mean, to combine that kind of ability to do research using data, but push the imagination first. Um, there's a lot of joy in that. A lot of joy and a hunch, a hypothesis. I mean, that's also what science is grounded in. And, you know, we, we, we don't, we forget that science starts with an imagine, imaginative spark often mm -hmm. as well, right? A hunch, a hypothesis. Yeah, I think that's right. So, and there's, you have to take risks in both areas, it seems like the risk maybe in using your imagination first might might be bigger, maybe out of fear of it, that not being the respected tool. Although we've got a creative faculty and creative student body, so that I think that helps a lot. But it's a it is a strange time. And since I mean, since we're talking about the pandemic, um and sort of the notion that it's really necessary to be innovative and creative right now, but there's so much uncertainty. And one, one of the things I think that you're doing in your book is trying to help people understand that uncertainty is not a negative, that uncertainty is, can, can result in creativity, but right now the uncertainty is extraordinary. Right. And so getting comfortable with this level of uncertainty is, is really, hard and I, I I actually had thought about asking that question even before you brought up the pandemic how to be uncomfortable with this level of uncertainty is is a question that I think would be great to explore right and it's a good segue from the last question about data again that's often what I encountered people want certainty they, they think the data gives them certainty and in organizations that's why people often be, depend on the data because they're hoping to find some nugget of certainty. Um, fortunately, and I think for all, all of the William Mary students who are watching this, I think the pandemic has changed business in, in ways that we can't fully appreciate right now. But I, I, of the business people I stay in contact with and the advisory work I do, um, people are starting to say, what do we got to lose? Let's give mm -hmm. a shot at that because things are so uncertain. 
why not give it a shot? And I think that's when things are so uncertain, a good answer is why not? Mm -hmm. What you want to do is you want to hunker down. And that's usually all of our instinct is you want to say, I think I can control this, this chaos. So let's change nothing, right? We'll just, everything will go back to normal and we'll, that everything will be fine. But because this pandemic is so un unusual and it's gone on for as long as it has, I think that's cut down that normal defense. Um, and I'm really encouraged that I see many organizations trying things that I bet you two years ago, they never would have tried. I mean, I, I think about, I, you know, William Mary, I mean, you, you, taught, you, you and I were talking earlier about the way classes are being scheduled. And I mean, the idea of doing distance learning it, it was around the edges, right? But now it, 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 so I think that it's been a real tipping point. So I guess that would be the message is in the face of just incredible uncertainty, what choice do you have, but to try to go forward, you know, you don't, you don't bet the whole company, you don't bet the whole institution, but you go forward to learn, to kind of test, to see what you can figure out. One of the practices I always um, love doing in the course of work, and I found it very helpful in life, is just sort of getting myself out there and being good at discovery. And it's where you sort of forcing yourself to go to those places where it's it's very uncertain, where maybe you think things are we even weird, um, because you're in discovery mode and you're you're almost like an investigator. You're trying to see what you find out. And and I had a rule of thumb like going on threes. The first time you'd find you'd see something, you make note of it. I actually have a folder I keep in my phone uh, of interestingness. And, um, and like the second time I'd see maybe the same theme, I'd go oh, ask, is this a coincidence? Third time I just declare it's a trend. So part of what you're trying to do on uncertainty is start to sense, can you see certain patterns? Can you see certain things? Um, I, I think, especially right now, what choice do we have? Mm -hmm. Yeah. It is interesting too, to think about going to, um, I don't know, uncomfortable places, but we don't really, we, we do go there. We are going there now, although we're going there through technology, yeah. which is also its own uncomfortable space. Definitely. And I'm, I, you won't know it by this conversation, but I identify more as an introvert. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, Zoom is both a friend and a foe in these situations. But one of the things I had to really work on was putting myself out there physically. I, I mean, Mm -hmm. Trust you. Trust me. I like I like sitting home and reading a book. I I had to learn to like gatherings, and I had to get over you know, find a way to come and introduce myself. Hi, Teresa. I'm Beth, and then I would let myself go home mm -hmm. and read that book. Um, and that I came to love social engagement, but it's not my natural act. And it's the same way with kind of ferreting out things that are different or weird. Maybe a good test for uh, for anyone who's watching this is you know to think back five or eight years ago of something you thought was really weird that you laughed at, that now is mainstream. I don't know when I ask you that, Teresa. Do you think of anything like what do you think five or eight years ago? Is there something that is mainstream now that you would you were going? Oh, that's so silly. It's never going to take off. Um. Yeah. I. I, well, I don't know that I thought it, something weird or silly would never take off, but about 10, eight to 10 years ago, we created a new curriculum at William & Mary, and it was really fun to work on it. And the people working on it, which many people, we, we worried that it couldn't take off. Um, so it's that, so almost the opposite of your, yeah. your question that um, we were dreaming kind of. And, thought, and, oh, and it took off, right? Eventually, did it? Eventually, yeah. yeah. But it, you also had to be patient with that, is what I'm hearing for that. You had to have that, you know, the imagination right. to kind of imagine it forward, if you will. Um, but often people don't stick with it. They're like, oh, that's too silly. They'll never go for that. No one will ever take off, you know, take, I mean, we're in Zoom at eight, five to eight years ago. The idea that we would be conducting a film festival discussion via our computer would have been seemed absurd. Oh yeah, well, and also last year, a year just a year ago, when we all sort of hunkered down, um, thinking about the film festival, you know, how we're, are we ever going to be able to have it again if we can't all go to the theater together? What is a film festival? And it turns out that actually, 
we are having one. Yeah. And out of this will come some probably very interesting aspects that you may want to keep in future film festivals. Um, oh, for so sure. I think that we'll be able to do the interviews much more easily. There, there will be there will be some exciting and good things, I think, that that come out of this. Yeah, um, I have I a few more that's questions. Really the point I'm making is just how, how do we open ourselves up to mm -hmm. things that might have at one point, like you said, this will never take off and it, and, it, and it, you stick with it. You had the imagination and it does. So let me ask you, you're a William & Mary alumna um, and you give advice to lots of kinds, different kinds of organizations about change and innovation and creativity and the imagination, all of that. What about higher education right now? What do you, when you think about universities, not only William & Mary, but universities, like what are, you, what are you seeing in terms of change and possibility and maybe even well, tension and conflict? Think, Teresa, if you and I had had this conversation even two years ago, I think it would have been 18 months ago, it would have been different. Uh, and again, I think it's to the discussion we're having earlier because I, uh, and I, I, I'm a very proud uh, alum of William & Mary, and I, I, I think the energy that, um, that has been brought to William & Mary uh, of late is very exciting. Uh, what Catherine Rowe and all of you have done. Uh, and I think you're willing to try different things, but I, um, I, I've always loved the liberal arts context of William & Mary. I know it made me a better person. Um, so while everybody may be going heavily into the data sciences, don't, you know, don't give up on that. But I do think um, a bit more education in kind of, or, or not education, opportunity. I'm big on this sort of figure it out concept. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I'm perhaps just validating more of the interdisciplinary studies because I really do think that's the way of innovation and learning. And the more you can allow people to connect dots and figure paths out, um, I think that's really where, where things have to go. Um, I think virtual learning clearly is, is, is a part of it. Um, I would challenge, I, I think financial models are clearly under pressure for, for education, but all these things I know you guys are, are looking at. Um, but mostly I think I would take a broader interdisciplinary approach just to education in general um, is maybe how I, I would think about it. Right, I mean, you went from biology to a kind of storytelling that makes the world of business better. And that's not, um, we don't have something, you can't major in whatever that would be called. That's, that's something you threaded together because the liberal arts context made it possible. Yeah, I, I, I majored in biology. I originally thought I was gonna to go to medical school, but what I really wanted to do was be a science reporter. And I remember, I mean, this was, you know, the dark ages now, but um, I couldn't get into the English program I wanted mm -hmm. because they were like, you're a science major. Um, I took a couple of classes, but I was so frustrated um, to not be able to do that. I'm sure that wouldn't exist at all today because again, I think a lot has, has changed there. Um, but it would have been interesting to think about the sort of the one, the serendipity of what, what else I might have put together. Like I, I minored if there was such a thing in anthropology, I loved that. Uh, I would say biology and anthropology really came to, to, to bear in business. Anthropology is about behavior. I became a marketer. Um, and I think the biology, the systems approach to life, how life exists through systems is really how business ought to work. Mm -hmm. And so those two things actually really helped me I think navigate business as a bit of an outsider. I didn't go to business school. I don't have my MBA. And I'm convinced that helped me. And perhaps I'd like to think that the William & Mary liberal arts perspective gave me that kind of ability to navigate in a way that had I been more siloed, I might not have been. Yeah, that's great to hear. I mean, that's what we're still, we're continuing to try to build scientists who think like artists and artists who who know how to do science and political science all of it and i love that emphasis on artists because i think now in kind of this phase of my life i've i felt somewhat like an artist in business and now i'm trying to be more more mindful about that rediscovering that art and had i thought of myself at age 18 as an artist navigating the world 
I might have done things much differently. Mm -hmm. um, and so I love that that's the way the way you're encouraging the perspective. Yeah, that all makes sense. I mean, you've chosen poetry right now and you like words and sometimes poems do tell a story, but they tell them in very, you know, it's it's the little um, nugget of the snapshot of a story that, right. that makes somebody feel something. I, that's why I love it. And I think that's for me, one of, when I went back at writing my book and just kind of, it was a good um, exercise to reflect on a career and a life, uh, that part of my life. But I came to appreciate that I am a storyteller. And I think I was able to own that. Um, story is about how you navigate the world. It's who you are and where are you going? And I think that's timeless, whether you're an artist, a business person, a chemist, I think that we all have a story uh, and it's kind of our mission in the world. So that would have been a thread. Had you said to me when I was graduating with Mary, I would not have said I'm a storyteller. But as it turns out, that's what I think was a thread that I've been able to pull through. Do you think you'll write another book? I don't know. I, uh, I, I it was a tough process. I had a co-writer. Um, I'm glad I did it. I liked again, the ability to tap into story. I, if I do, it's gonna be something very very different and very creative. Um, so who knows, but I don't know yet. I gotta, I gotta build up my confidence on the, on the creative side first. It sounds like it's there. Hopefully, I'm, I'm working on it. Um, so um, since people who are attending the festival are going to see this uh, interview, what, what else would you like people to hear and know about um, your thoughts on creativity and innovation and the imagination right now as we're coming, maybe as we're coming out of the pandemic and some other, you know, really serious crises in the country, like, do you feel hopeful? I, 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 I most days I feel hopeful. I will admit not every day. Um, because the problems we're facing are just so vast. I, some of the business work I'm doing now is focused on climate. That was something I got involved in in GE. And um, I mean, pick a lane, right? Healthcare, climate, homelessness. I mean, there are just so many daunting uh, problems. Um, but the only way we're going to solve these is with imagination and the people who have the ability to figure it out. And so um, I would just encourage and, you know, the folks who are watching this, especially people who are currently in school uh, or maybe alums who are finding some way to re 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 reinvigorate their, themselves. Um, it's about the ability to figure it out. And that's what the world needs because we're in this territory where yeah, history sometimes repeats itself, but this is, we haven't been here before in many ways. And so, and it can be very small. I mean, I, one of the, my part-time past, pastimes has been, I've been working on a forest restoration project. And it's a very small bit of land, me out there hoeing invasive plants on the weekends. Um, but one person can kind of make a difference. And there's a story of what I see and the wildlife I'm trying to help bring back to life. And so, you know, it starts with the story and an ability of a problem you're trying to solve and kind of put your imagination. Now I could go crazy telling you where my imagination is taking me of what might be possible. So um, that's what I'd say. It starts with imagination and uh, don't let the system squeeze it out of you. We need people who can figure it out to, to solve these big problems that we're all facing. That's lovely. Thank you so much. It's been a really, really quick half hour and just fabulous talking to you. Well, thank you, Teresa. I love the conversation. Great, great chance to, to dig in with you. And um, I really cheering you and William & Mary on. Uh, you have my heart. So uh, I, I wishing you all the best. Thank you so very much. Thanks a lot.